Well, you can grab a seat. You can grab your Bibles. We're going to dig deep this morning. Uh, we are in part two, three of our series titled, thank you, Bill. That's not the title of the series. The title of the series is uh, Erasing God. We are in part three of it. Um, and if you have, uh, hey, that was a nice little hip grab. That was, um, yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. Your husband would beat me up if that happened. Not your husband, her, this is getting complicated. Um, I had a spiritual moment going there, bros. Looking for a new bass player and a new acoustic guitar player. That's not true at all, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, uh, so we're, we're um, I'm kind of nervous about the message this morning, um, which I know is a shock because I get nervous every Sunday. Um, but uh, so we're we're in um, we're we're in part three of the series right now. In part one, we talked about the um, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the fact that God is one hundred percent God the Father, one hundred percent God the Son, one hundred percent God the Spirit, totaling up a total of one hundred percent, mathematically impossible. That's God. And if you remove God the Spirit from the equation, you've removed one hundred percent of the Trinity. So that was that was week one. Uh, week two, which was last week, we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that there's a pattern found throughout the book of Acts that after people accept Jesus as their personal Savior, they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but then there's a subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit that can take place. And we, I think we used like half the Bible last Sunday. And so if, if you missed either of those, those are foundational moments for what we're going to talk about today. But so if you missed any of them, you can always go online and you can check them out. All of our messages are there. You, you, can, you can watch, you can get, kind of get caught up. Um, but today we're going to talk about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And that's like a, a big fancy word. And so what, what that essentially means is like, how does the Holy Spirit move and look practically in our lives because we talk about the holy spirit but like, like like what does it do does it just do weird things does it do awesome things does it do powerful things like is it correct is it incorrect there's all these thoughts that can happen about the holy spirit and so today we're going to talk about what the manifestation of the holy spirit looks like um, and i thought there isn't a better day than the church's birthday uh, today is the roughly 1986th birthday of the church um, I Googled it, and that's what Google told me, and Google's always right, and so that's what I looked for. And so that the church started on Pentecost Sunday that many years ago. Like, that's when it was birthed. Jesus was, was crucified. He rose from the dead for 40 days. He appeared to the disciples. For 10 days, they waited for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit dropped on them, and the church was birthed. So let's read that. Acts chapter 2. Acts Chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. We have tons of Bibles just free, given to you because everybody should have a Bible. You should always be checking what I'm reading. But if you don't have one right now, we'll have the biggest Bible in the room on the back of the screen. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. This is the believers. They've been waiting for this moment. There was an expectation for this moment. They didn't just stumble into the room. They, they weren't showing up for church at the last minute. I mean, they, they were anticipating this moment. Great expectation. They were in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Say that with me right now. Filled with the Holy Spirit. You know where I'm going. Let's try it round three. Filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down right now. And they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And when you start reading this, for some people, the, the, like the, the lack of comfort starts to take place. Like you've been in the church before, you've heard the phrase Holy Spirit, you've heard the phrase tongues, you know it's somewhere in here, but like I hope he doesn't preach on it that Sunday, and I hope that's not the day that I bring a friend, right? 
Because like you bring people to church, you're like, just please let it not be the weird Sunday when I bring the friend. Okay, we're not going to get weird today. We're going to get biblical today. All right? And this is not going to be me giving my opinions. I just want to read scripture to you. Like, like, like if God wrote this book, like by his spirit, he, he, he gave people the, the, the anointing and the gifting to co-author this book, and it was formulated, and 2,000 years later, it's still in existence. It's, it's perfect. It's without error. Like if this is in front of us, we should probably pick it apart, right? We should probably dive into it. We should probably look at what it means. And so the Holy Spirit comes down right now, and they begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, a heavenly language. And this one's pretty crazy, what's about to happen. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's a lot of different nations. Like, I don't know how many there are, but all of them is a lot. And they're all there, and at this sound, with the sound of the mighty rushing wind, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. They were confused. They didn't know what the heck was going on, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So you have these people that the Holy Spirit's fallen on them. They begin to to speak in tongues, and all of these different nations start to hear what they're saying in their own language. Like, this is supernatural, what's going on. Like, it is outside of natural ability that's taking place. Uh, Kind of like the birth of Jesus. Supernatural, right? Like, the fact that somebody's born of a virgin, that is supernatural. The fact that he lived this life in a way that was perfect and sinless, that's, that's supernatural. The fact that he was crucified and then rose from the grave and conquered the dead, like, that's supernatural. There are supernatural things all around us that we can't explain. Like, like just look at how a baby is born. Lord have mercy. That, that's, like, that doesn't just happen. Like, there, there's, a, there's an element of God that's moving in there. And so supernatural, like you're a supernatural gift. The fact that you're here is incredible. There's supernatural moments all over this earth, and this is one of them that's about to happen right now. It's a a supernatural moment. Without the movement of God in this moment, it's not going to happen. Without the movement of God giving you breath in your lungs, it's not going to happen. Without the movement of God, this Bible's not going to happen. Without the movement of God, our feet wouldn't stick to this earth with gravity. I mean, supernatural things are all over the place. And this is one of them. So they start to hear the sound of people speaking in their own language, and they were amazed, no kidding. And they were astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, uh, Cretans and Arabians, all these different people, they're all gathered together, hearing it in their own language. And we hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking them, saying they're filled with new wine. So, like, there's half of the group that's like, this is awesome. And there's half of them that are like, they're drunk. Like, there's two sides of it right now, and and Peter's going to go on and preach a sermon about them not being drunk. And he's going to preach a sermon about how Jesus came to save you from your sins and the fact that if you trust in Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven. But without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're destined for separation. He's, he's going to preach this whole sermon. You, you can read it. I'm not going to preach that one at you. And, and here's the outcome of Pentecost Sunday. And this is just, to give you an idea, this auditorium, if we packed this auditorium out, we would have about six to 700 people. If we, just, if we packed it out, In verse 37, now when they heard this sermon he preached, they were cut to their heart. And Peter said to the rest of the apostles, brother, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. That's us. Everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. That's us. And with many other words, as he kept on preaching, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then verse 41, here's the fruit 
of Pentecost Sunday. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a good day in church. That's a real good day in church when 3,000, not 3,000 people came, 3,000 people responded to the altar call. Like that's, that's a big day right there. I got beef with the church. I'll tell you all about it right now. The American church, I love the American church. This is a church in America. Therefore, by definition, this is an American church. I would say probably everybody here, even Victor, is American. How about that? Citizenship. It's a good thing. Like we, we have, this is an American church right here. And this is what American church looks like a lot of times. And we're part of it, and I'm not against it. Like, we want to make sure that this room is 72 degrees. And if it's 75 degrees, people flip out. Or if it's like 67 degrees, people like start bringing like snow suits to this place. Like it's like, it needs to be 72 degrees or like the Holy Spirit's not going to work. Like that's super important for the church in America. We also have to make sure that tent is set up outside and you got usually Crystal with this happy little sign that says the best is yet to come when you walk in and she smiles and she greets you. Like that's got to happen. The donuts, thank you Jesus for country style donuts. Woo, so good. They better be there. We miss donuts, I'm going to hear about it. Like, I'm going to get church emails. I'm leaving the church because you didn't buy the donuts. The coffee better be brewed. It better be hot. You better have a pot of decaf coffee. No one's going to drink it because decaf coffee is the worst. But you still got to have it. Kids check-in needs to work so your kids get that pretty little sticker so no one steals your kids. And all the kids' workers have to be there with background checks and everything nice and order. And the, the auditorium better be set up right. And the projector better not be off. And that light is about three degrees crooked. That's a problem. I guess... We are so particular in the American church about how all these things work. But I just read about the first church service. There was nothing about the temperature in there. There was nothing about country style donuts. I'm sure they had them because they're awesome. They're like, they're, I don't know if they had the right ratio of kids workers. I have no idea. Like, you got to have a certain number for babies because they take more time, and you can kind of fudge. I didn't see it in there. I, I, I did not see the order of service grace for how they were supposed to roll through worship found in Acts chapter 2. Like, like, all of that, it's not in there. Now, I'm not saying it's not important. Don't get me wrong. We want to do things with excellence because it's done for Jesus. It should be done better. But the things that we sometimes make the main thing are actually not the main thing. The thing that took place in Acts chapter 2 was the move of the Holy Spirit. It was not about the structure of the service. It was not. A, if you read Peter's sermon, it wasn't even that good. Like I, like, like I thought about reading it to you all, but it's kind of boring. Like, it, like it, that would not make the Instagram highlights, Peter's sermon right there. It had great truth. It was spirit empowered. It was effective, but it's kind of like, eh. It wasn't about all of the things. It was about the move of the Spirit. And let, let, let me just explain this to you for a moment. If you're going to leave a church because the donuts aren't right, or if you're going to leave a church because the kids' ministry isn't exactly how you think it should be, or if you're going to leave a church because any of these other reasons, like that's not the reason to get disconnected from the church. You should be connected to the church, not because of all the things, but because of the Spirit of God moving within the local church. And that is what matters. And so I, I want us to... Look at how the Spirit did things. Like the, the Holy Spirit does miracles. Like le legit miracles. People that were sick are miraculously healed. Not like they put a Band-Aid on and it got better and they're kind of fudging it, but no, like for real, for real healed. Like, people give words of knowledge through the Holy Spirit. Like, you talk to a stranger, and, and God just gives you this word, and you share it with them, and the receiver of it's like, how the heck do you know that? Like, that's personal stuff, right? Like, a real move. Don't, do you want that in your life? Like, like that's what I want. I, I don't want this, this, this fake church stuff. 
I want like the, the real deal, Holy Spirit empowered, ground shaking, life changing power of God in my life and in this church. And so Acts chapter two, here we go. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. You cannot get around that part of scripture and have a spirit and power church. Like you, you look in this moment right now, there was a, a filling of the spirit and there was a manifestation of those people who had the spirit in their life speaking in tongues. There are other manifestations of the Spirit. There's the manifestation of prophecy. There's the manifestation of wisdom. There's the manifestation of teaching, the manifestation of... There's so many different ones. But the one that's mentioned here and the one that's mentioned throughout the majority of the book of Acts is the gift of tongues. And so I'm not saying this is the only one, but I am going to highlight this one today because it's the one that's talked about the most. So let's flip to the book of Acts, same book, but we're going to go to chapter 19 right now. And so the church is growing Holy Spirit came, 3,000 people get saved. Then I think a couple day, days later, like 5,000 people got saved, and then a couple more, and they're baptizing random people, and like the, the church is blowing up. It is crazy what is happening. We read this passage last week in Acts chapter 19. Where are we at? I got to find it. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, that's a place, it'd be like while Paul was in Verina, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples and said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We've not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Uh, there we go, I said it before it happened telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in German. No. They began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So there's another pattern right now found. This is the second time, and you can look through the book of Acts. There's this thing of where the Holy Spirit moves, and then people begin to speak in tongues, or they begin to, to prophesy. That when the Holy Spirit moves, like supernatural things take place. And when supernatural things take place like that, you need some order to things. You need some clarification to things. You can't just have this free-for-all found in church. And so, so Paul writes 1 Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians in the 14th chapter, he begins to give some clarification to how all of this stuff works. And for, for me, th this was new to me at one point. Like, like, I had no idea how all this worked, and nobody had explained it to me. And so, thankfully, Paul explains it. I should have started there. Rather than asking people, I should have just read my Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You all should know 1 Corinthians 14 because 1 Corinthians 13 is the passage that everybody reads at weddings. It's all about love. And then in, four, in chapter 14, he talks all about tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is probably the best passage in the Bible that you can use as a foundational text for the gift of tongues within the local church. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Can I just preach on this for a year and a half? People in the church are called to love one another. Right? I, I, when, you, when you engage with somebody, when you talk with somebody, when you're hanging out with somebody, when you see a stranger, when you see somebody you know, anybody you see, like the love of Jesus should be so much in you that they can't help but see the love that's found within you. Like when you're talking to me, like, I, I hope when people talk to me, they're like, man, that guy is full of love. Like, not that he's full of energy, not that he's full of caffeine, but I want people to hopefully see the love of God inside me, that every single person I talk to, like, love, 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 love. Unfortunately, the church is often known for how it hates. Maybe that's why it's being ineffective in many ways. But if we're known for how we love, like, that is, that is the root of it right there. Jesus boils down the entire Bible to say, love God and love people. It's about how we love, love, love. The second thing they say right there is, love people, 
and earnestly seek the gifts. And for, for me, I mean, honestly, I, there's so many times where I have neglected personally to earnestly seek the gifts. And some of it, God bless you, is because maybe I didn't fully understand it. I was a little bit uncomfortable with it. But like, like Paul's telling us, if you love Jesus, love people, earnestly seek the gifts. Like, like that's the mandate right there. That's not what Michael said. That's, what, that's what, what Paul is telling the church. It's the church in Corinth. He gathers them all together and says, hey, love people, seek the gifts. And, and then he starts to give some, some, some further instruction about it. He says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For if one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. The one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. Like, that's a big statement right there. Like, if I, if I could quote Paul right now, my hope, my prayer, is that every single person in here would speak in tongues. And, and like, that's a radical statement right there. Like, you say that, and, like, you might get stoned in some churches, but, like, I'm, I'm not trying to twist things. It just says... Now I want you all to speak in tongues. It's, it's right there. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. And even, even more prophecy, because the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. But there's a, a request from Paul to seek the spiritual gifts, to seek the gift of prophecy, to seek the gift of tongues. And I don't even know if in this these scriptures right now, you've caught there was four different instances of tongues that were found right there. Acts chapter 2, there was tongues that were spoken. People heard the message in their own language. That was a specific moment in the book of Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 19, people were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues as evidence. No interpretation in Acts chapter 19. No interpretation in Acts chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about tongues for building oneself up and how that's not as good as prophesying. Unless there is tongues where there is an interpretation. So you have personal prayer time in tongues, and then you also have the public moment of tongues. And, and actually, tongues is not so much for the church as for the unbeliever. It says that in 1 Corinthians 14. This is wild. I read 1 Corinthians 14, and I heard if someone speaks in tongues publicly, there needs to be an interpretation, and it's not for the believer, it's for the unbeliever. So I'm in the middle of a church service, and I told you, my first tongues experience where I freaked out and turned ghost white and stumbled through the announcements afterwards. So that was my first one. My second experience, guy speaks in tongues. Like, the service goes dead quiet. Like, bust out in what I would best declare as tongues. Another guy stands up, gives an interpretation, sits down, and this guy in the back of the room stands up, runs to the altar, and gives his life to Jesus. And I'm like, this is still happening right now. This is exactly what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Like this, this is how the church is supposed to function. This is what it looks like when the church has Holy Spirit power. And so, so I hope and I pray that we have moments like that in this church. We, we haven't had them yet, but like I, I hope and I pray that we have moments that are spiritually empowered and follow the pattern of the book of Acts, the pattern of the book of 1 Corinthians, and the power throughout the New Testament of the Holy Spirit moving in supernatural ways. Like, I desire for that. But here's the, here's the catch. I haven't given you the title of the message yet because the title of the message is a really, really good one. It's really good. Title of the message, it's Racing God, Part 3, The Power of Pentecost and the Magician's Mistake. I've worked for a, a while on that one right there. It sounds like a Harry Potter novel title. It's, it's good. I'm not supporting or not supporting Harry Potter. Do not stone me. Acts chapter 
8, we get an incredibly balanced view of what it looks like to pursue the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. So there's a guy named Simon in chapter 8, verse 8. Verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. Like this wasn't like a sleight of hand kind of magician. Like this was a guy who was like, he was doing crazy things. And he was saying that he himself was somebody great. He was pretending to be God. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man has the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him for a long time because he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he was preaching the good news, Philip came into town and started preaching about Jesus. When they believed him about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and having been baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And now the magician is amazed. Verse 14, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they'd only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray that the Lord, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, and Simon answered, Pray for me, Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Simon hears the message of Jesus, responds to the message of Jesus. He sees the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, and he becomes infatuated with it. He becomes obsessed with the work of the Holy Spirit so much that, like, in the middle of church, he, like, breaks out his wall, and he's like, Hey, I want that. Like, he's willing to literally pay for the gift of God in his life. He is so desperate for the move of the Spirit that he's going to pay for it. And they correct him saying, no, 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 no. Your heart is not right. And what can happen when you start to talk about the miraculous things of the Holy Spirit, you can become so focused on the gift that you miss the giver of the gift. And I would say if you are looking for Holy Spirit power in your life, the focus should not be on the gift, but rather on the giver of the gift. The more you seek after the Holy Spirit, the more you seek after God, the more you ask Him in faith, then by following Him, He will answer your request and give you those gifts, but not because you've just asked for the gifts, but because you've been in love with Him first. And that is such an important distinction to make that you need to pursue the giver and not just the gift. And I'm going to invite the worship team back up right now, and I want to read a passage to you that was not in, it's on the screen. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As I'm flipping there, my hope is that you've taken these scriptures and wrote them down so that you can investigate them on your own time. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through 30. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? 
are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? For the record, the answer to those questions is no to each one of them. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way, and the excellent way is love. As, as I read through these gifts, I have a couple questions that come to mind. Um, one question is corporately how those work. Am I seeing the gift of teaching found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of administration found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of knowledge found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of miracles found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of tongues found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of interpretation found in our church? Am I seeing the gift of prophecy found in our church? And I could go through the entire list, but I, but I ask myself, like, are these gifts in existence within our church? And if the answer is yes, praise be to God, but if the answer is no, I have to wonder, okay, how, how do we work on this? And where, where are, 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 are we missing it? Because we've already lined up through the last two weeks now that the Holy Spirit is 100% God. The move of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so important for believers. And now we're talking about what it looks like practically for that to take place. And so if those gifts aren't moving, it's because the people in the church aren't moving in them. Like somebody has to move in the gift of administration. Somebody has to move in the gift of helping. Somebody has to move in the gift of apostleship. Somebody, and then we could go through all of these, and the people who are the somebodies, who are the somebodies? Like, there's not this secret group of people in the ceiling right now. That like when there's a crisis, all of a sudden we like throw up the rise signal, and we drop down fire poles, and they slide down to operate in the gifts. Like, that, that's not how it works. The people that those gifts uh, the people that have those gifts are found in these seats right now. It's a matter of activating those gifts. It's a matter of you getting alone one-on-one -on -one with God and saying, God, you have these gifts that are found in Scripture. And for whatever reason, I, I haven't embraced them. But God, I pray that if these gifts are for now and if they're for me, God, that you would allow them to take place. And not every single person will have the gift of help. And not every single person will have the gift of talks. And not every single person will have the gift of teaching. But every single one of you has been given a gift by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's your responsibility to steward that gift and to use that gift for the glory of God. So when we talk about erasing God, The tragedy in that is that we're sometimes erasing his power. Erasing the thing that took the church from a handful of people to 3,000 overnight. And my hope and my prayer and my desire is for the people that call the rise home and in fact churches throughout the globe to embrace the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask if we could bow our heads this morning. You've been thrown a lot of information. If you need to step into some of the giftings, You've been held back by maybe mindsets, maybe incomplete Bible teaching, your own personality in the way. If you need to step into the giftings of the Holy Spirit, I want to ask if you raise your hand right now. Oh God, I pray for each person right now that is admitting to you that they need to use the gifts that you've given them. 
God, and they just desire for the gifts. Lord, I thank you that we don't need to beg and plead for them. You just give them to us. And so, God, I pray that you would do it. And that you would do that in Jesus' name. we could stand to our feet for a moment, I want to close with, with this. How many of y'all love Christmas? I love Christmas. Only anybody that doesn't like Christmas. If you don't like Christmas, I don't trust you. For real. And I love on Christmas. Like Eric and I will stay up late. We'll wrap the presents. Let me. Re- she'll wrap the presents. I don't do a very good job of wrapping presents. I get impatient. And it looks like I'm a third grader when it finishes. So she'll wrap them, and I'll put the bows on top, and we'll organize them under the tree. And one of the greatest joys, if you have kids, is to watch your kids' face as they come down on Christmas morning. Like I, I love it. Like we'll 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 hide a little camera just to catch their face as they see these gifts. And, and you see this gift. Imagine if like Abigail, my, my little girl, my little two-year-old, imagine if she, she's, she's freaking adorable. Imagine if she picked up a gift and it has her name on it. I'm like, nope, not today, and take it and walk off with it. Like no father does that. Like you, you get gifts to give the gifts to your kids. Like, that's the whole reason for the gift giving. Not for gift, it's called gift giving, not gift taking. Like, if you're gonna give the gift, you give the gift. You don't give it to them and take it back. Nor will we be sitting there on Christmas morning and we should be saying, Daddy, please, 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 please. I know my name's on it, I know it's for me, but would you please give me this? She doesn't have to beg for it. Like, her father loves her, he's gonna give her a gift. We're not going to give her like 15 million gifts and we're not going to be that family. We'll give her a gift and she can keep it. It is hers. The same thing's true when God gives gifts. Like you don't have to come down on, on Christmas morning or come down at a church service and beg and beg and beg and plead and plead and plead. God, give me this gift. I just want this gift. Would you please? He's going to give you the gift if you ask. And then it's a matter of you owning the gift, taking it and using it. That's it. It's not a 77-step process to walk in gifted. It's a gift given to God. Now, I will say that Abby would have to go grab the gift and take the gift and unwrap the gift and use the gift. I'm not going to use her gift for her. She needs to stop out and step out and use her gift herself. And the same is true for believers. God's going to give you the gift, but you have to be the one who takes it and walks in it. And so as we prepare to kind of have some altar time right now and to worship and to pray. Earnestly seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so, Lord, I pray for each person once again, God, that they wouldn't have to beg, they wouldn't have to plead, but you would just give them the gifts in Jesus' name. Amen.